Yeah, I, I just wanted to point it, point out that it's different from a lot of talks. Uh, so, uh, looking at super, as heroin-assisted treatment or supervised heroin uh, treatment, and in particular looking at whether it might uh, be an important missing treatment uh, for those for that patient population who just don't obtain the benefit that we would have expected to obtain. And, and that's the crucial bit about this. this. This isn't in competition with treatments we've got. This is, is there something for those individuals who don't benefit that we, that we could do? So that, that's the crucial point. And we're, we're at a really exciting point uh, that uh, what we have is, is good scientific we've had the ability to prescribe heroin in, in the UK for a century and we haven't had trials uh, that indicated one way or the other. Over the last 15 years uh, there's now half a dozen well-designed studies around the world uh, and that's what I'm going to summarise. So various declarations, people can read through them at their leisure, but essentially that I'm a clinician and I'm academic, I've worked with policy review groups, I've worked with industry, uh, I've worked with charities and so on and so on. Um, the, the various different groups who supported uh, the, both the setting up of the clinic uh, and the research study of it, uh, all sorts of colleagues um, without whom the, the study wouldn't have been possible. Uh, in particular, I mean, we heard about the Swiss work. Uh, the Swiss initiative uh, was crucial to the development of the notion of supervised heroin prescribing. So we'd done heroin prescribing in a sort of haphazard way, uh, particularly south of the border, actually mainly around London. Uh, and. Ambrose Uchtenhagen and colleagues came over from Switzerland and they took this sort of rusty old penknife that we had and went away and developed a sort of gleaming, glorious Swiss army penknife instead. You know, they just made it into a much more uh, fit-for-purpose approach to treatment. Uh, colleagues in the Netherlands um, and then the Canadian group also uh, sort of incrementally have built uh, on... Uh, the strength of that. So here's what I'm going to cover. There's about sort of three to four minutes on each, <laughs> on each of these areas. So, um, so the, the history of it, how did it come about? Uh, the U, we, we have a particular responsibility internationally to explore this area. We're probably the only country in the world uh, where we don't have a legal obstacle. We don't have any legal hurdle. Most other countries have to pass laws to permit the prescribing of diamorphine. In the UK, you know, it's there in BNF as a medicine. You know, it's a medicinal product. So, and we can use it within addiction treatment. So our problem is working out how do we, you know, what place do we think it has and how do we set up the services to make it available. Uh, the, the concept of injectable maintenance has a long history. Uh, but in fact, over the last 30 years or so, it's largely been overtaken by the huge evidence base that we've got around oral maintenance treatments. So as uh, oral methadone and buprenorphine treatment have become stronger and stronger as an evidence base and have rightly become the dominant medications, the issue is we may have lost a treatment which has an which has an important niche contribution to make. Um, for I'm going to skip through this just for, for time reasons actually. So uh, the injectable prescribing that has always existed in the UK became less and less and less. Uh, and if you look at where it exists now, it, it's about one percent of treatment, or probably less than one percent of treatment. And I presume it's zero percent of treatment, um, you know, in Scotland. Uh, but across the UK, it's sort of about one percent of treatment. Um, however, you've you've got uh, government and the legal situation being open to consideration a bit. Uh, so. Uh, the 2000 and, uh, 2002 drug strategy uh, talked about the fact that there should be the option uh, of prescribed supervised heroin, and I'll come on to the quotes of that, 
uh, so that it's been kept open as an option, uh, but at a local level it then doesn't get supported. Uh, so, as I say, the, the two products that exist in the UK treatment system uh, have been either heroin prescribing or injectable methadone prescribing, which would sometimes be referred to as dry amps being the freeze-dried heroin ampules uh, or wet amps being the um, methadone ampules. Uh, and I'll refer to both uh, injectable heroin prescribing and injectable methadone prescribing in the trial that I'll move on to. So, how did the riot trial come about? Uh, so, just to, re to restate this point, let's locate what, it, what is the problem that we're trying to address. We, we aren't trying to alter the fact that the first line response to treatment should be good quality oral maintenance treatment. That continues to be what we'd expect it to be. If somebody then is not benefiting from that, they should go into an op optimization sort of box where you address what's wrong with your OST. Uh, however, where there's still persistent failure and you just can't get it to work with the person you're working with, a possibility is, is a brief trial of supervised heroin prescribing and as with other treatments that you do that may be very intensive or very expensive or have intrinsic risks associated with them if you get a benefit you'd continue with that but if you don't you, you you wouldn't continue with an intensive treatment which was not delivering the benefit uh, it would only be if it continued that you carried on carry on so in clinical practice that's how it would operate so you, you had the uk government's drug strategy uh, back in 2002 said that heroin should be available on prescription to all those who have a clinical need for it. Now they didn't then dis define what the hell a clinical need for it meant uh, but they also gave a blueprint for how it should operate. So uh, the administration of prescribed heroin uh, for those with a clinical need will take place in safe medically supervised areas with clean needles with strict and verifiable measures to ensure that there's no seepage into the wider community. And that's essentially the blueprint uh, for how uh, supervised heroin prescribing uh, maintenance operates. Uh, you know, from the slides, if you're looking them up, here, here's the sort of key papers that have come out. Uh, they're in major journals. Uh, they're well-designed studies. So when people are saying, well, have we got an evidence base for it? You know, you've now got a series of strong studies judged to be suitable to be published in leading journals. So it's a, pr a pretty strong evidence base now. So how do they actually work in practice? <coughs> Probably the real shock to the system is they're seven days a week, 365 days per year. I remember when we got the funding for the clinic, I was sort of really excited. We'd finally got the funding for the clinic and we had a, a sort of team meeting with all the staff and I couldn't work out. Other people just weren't as enthusiastic as I was when I said, look, it's really great news. We've now got this clinic that we'll run, you know, every day of the week, uh, every day of the year. And, you know, some people just didn't seem as excited, <laughs> excited as I was. I but anyway, so getting it going is quite an organisational challenge and it's quite a good jolt to the system anyway. Uh, but it, it, so the patient self-administers the, the prescribed pharmaceutical medication, uh, but they self-administer under supervision, which is enough to make sure that it's safe and that nothing sort of you know, nonsense is going on uh, with a sufficient respect for personal space. It actually it's pretty quick to work out um, how to make that work. There's no take home injectable doses. That, from a public debate point of view, that was hugely valuable to be able to say whatever you might, you know, whether you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, none of what we prescribe gets into, into the community at all. Uh, that we, you know, we believe that there's good benefit to the individual but there isn't any leakage into the community. Uh, if somebody can't come in for a clinic appointment, we have a system of sort of ready conversion that you can say, look, my, 
my mum is visiting for the weekend. Um, I don't want. You know, I I just want to concentrate on that. Can I have oral uh, doses instead? You so you could have a converted oral dose as a take home, but no uh, take home injectables. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, and th this is the, the singularly unremarkable. So the capital outlay was to go down to IKEA and to get some desks and things and put them in. Uh, the, it is, it's deliberately quite a medical procedure, it's a sort of clinical sterile procedure. Uh, so the, you know, the nurse would prepare the medication uh, as if it was any other medication. You know, it, it's a medicinal drug, so it sort of comes in ampules or vials, depending which, uh, which type you use. Um, you know, the patient's then called in. Uh, it, it's been, pre been prepared in advance. Uh, the patient then self-administers it. Uh, we then keep an eye on the patient until we think they're safe uh, to leave the premises and they then leave. So, it, so the, these are individuals who've been quite carefully, uh, it's quite a high threshold treatment uh, as with any other maintenance treatment, we would start low and then incrementally, with the patient, build up their dose until they and we agreed uh, that it was the correct dose. Because it's completely supervised, uh, you, know, you can then be quite comfortable in that negotiation about allowing it to be quite a high dose. Uh, I'd previously been involved with the, like, the old British system of unsupervised maintenance prescri injectable prescribing where you're endlessly paranoid about diversion and you're, you're being as mean as you can be and there's a sort of ridiculous tussle where you're trying to drag the dose down and the patient's doing their chest move to try and outmaneuver you and get the dose up. This you go, okay, look, if it should be larger dose, fine, but there isn't any potential uh, for it to be taken out. <laughs> okay, so the, these were, we ran it for five years uh, as a randomised trial to see did it make a difference to people who were doing badly in their treatment, and then we ran it for another four years uh, as a treatment system until we, uh, we ran into funding problems last year and all three of the clinics uh, that existed in England uh, lost their funding just as part of the cuts that we had uh, in England. So. Well, the target population are people who've just got completely entrenched. They, they had an average uh, of about 15 years of heroin history. So we're talking of the severe end of the population in contact with services where the regular treatments were not working. And despite treatment, people were still injecting heroin all days or most days uh, per month. Reminding you of the fact, so it's where ordinary treatment hasn't worked. And so we, we, we took our population of people coming into treatment and they were then randomised into either getting the best we could deliver with oral methadone. So we looked at making the oral methadone as good as it could be, uh, or supervised injectable methadone or supervised injectable heroin. So that's the three, you know, if you think of a, a randomised trial is like a race where you're seeing how much benefit your three, you, you, the three horses are going to give you. Those were the three groups uh, that we were comparing. And we were looking for reduction in street heroin use. Uh, and we, we, we decided operationally that we wanted to know uh, how many were responders to the treatment so that they largely quit their street heroin use. Uh, we thought it was unrealistic to think that within the study period of six months uh, people would give up completely. So our main measure was how many uh, were not using street heroin on most days per month. Uh, but we also measured how many uh, became completely, completely quit their street heroin use. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, so it was reducing or quitting street heroin use. Uh, whatever group we met always wanted to have a different outcome measure. You just you learn to have to go. Oh, you know, I mean, we measure all of these, but in doing a trial, you've got to specify in advance what you're going to study as your primary outcome. 
And we thought that was the one that was the real measure of whether the treatment genuinely was having an effect in turning people, helping people turn their lives around. Um, just retention in treatment seemed to us not to be a very good measure if we weren't getting other benefits as well. And we'd like to see criminal behaviour reducing significantly, and the Home Office obviously was particularly interested in that measure. But again, we'd only expect that to be the case because people would, were demonstrating a benefit. Uh, it would be secondary to those others. Uh, yep. And uh, because we're a sort of suspicious bunch, then, you know, we, we, we wanted to have urine test results as well as self-report. Uh, one of the criticisms there'd been of some of the earlier uh, heroin trial studies was that uh, they had, the, out, the outcomes were, were based on self-report. Uh, most measures of self-report show them to be very good uh, in trials in the addictions field, uh, but it was a criticism. So we, we introduced urine testing as well as self-report in the outcome measures that we looked at. Uh, we, we had to develop a sort of special test uh, to differentiate between pharmaceutical heroin and street heroin, uh, which turned out to be no, not particularly difficult. You just uh, you measure some of the other substances uh, that are in street heroin and uh, papaverine, which is a sort of um, part of what comes from the poppy, uh, is removed in the pharmaceutical process, but it's still there in the street drug. So we would test for papaverine and that worked, uh, um, that worked very well. It was there for 40, uh, 48 to 72 hours after somebody used street heroin. So it was quite a good way of testing uh, for somebody's street heroin use. Uh, the, the key results from the paper, someone's wanting to look it up. There's a sort of nerdy database um, paper with lots of statistics in it, um, but it was the key findings from the paper uh, which uh, came out and broadly found the same results uh, as the other trials. So you've got a reassuring situation that across uh, Switzerland, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, UK, uh, a, a very consistent finding uh, with this treatment being applied in quite different national settings. So to, to sort of summarise the findings, so I, if any of you nodded off, these are the four key take-home messages and then I'll just show you it in, in a little bit more detail. So the supervised heroin group, so these are the three randomised groups. The supervised heroin group made the strongest progress, quite markedly so. Uh, the supervised injectable methadone group did better than the optimised oral methadone, but not a great deal better. So the, the supervised heroin group were, were a long way ahead. Supervised injectable methadone did better than the oral uh, methadone, but interestingly, the oral methadone group also did benefit. So these were people who were supposedly already being well treated, and when we took them into the trial, even the group who stayed with oral methadone, we got significant improvements with them from, I guess, the fuller attention uh, and the startling therapeutic skills that um, we applied. Uh, the, the other feature that I really I found very striking was how quickly the benefits that occurred were seen. So I, I'll show you those four areas very quickly. So just to remind you, we're looking at responders to people largely quit their, heroin, their street heroin use. And then also because the political landscape had changed, people wanted to know were, were people completely abstinent from street heroin or not, which is a pretty major ask for a group who've persistently failed in treatment, but I'll, I'll show you those in, in a minute. So here's the three runners. You know, here's your oral methadone group, uh, your supervised injectable methadone group, and your supervised injectable heroin group. And this is at the start of treatment, and red means they're doing badly. You know, they're, they're all still regular street heroin injectors. And of course they're all 100% because they're, rec you know, they're recruited into the trial because of that. So how did they do when we studied them at six months? So we looked at what have their urine test results been between months four to six, and we did random urine tests over those weeks. So it's 13 weeks, uh, you have random tests, uh, and how many achieved this uh, 
Uh, what, what you've got here is how many had completely clean uh, urines. Uh, so you've got uh, um, you've got the the only group uh, with major improvements was the supervised heroin group, and you've got your supervised methadone injectable methadone group being not a great deal better uh, than your oral methadone group. Uh, now. If you then said, well, how many are completely abstinent? Uh, you get completely abstinent from street heroin. Uh, you only really see it in the supervised heroin group. You get virtually nothing in the other two groups. And as a, as a clinician, you know, despite the sort of tough talking, I'm then a bit of a soft touch when it comes to sort of indivi individual treatments. If somebody had one dirty urine, I'd go, well, you know, that's still pretty good. So let's factor that in. What if you allowed one of those 13 being dirty? Again, you've got, you know, nearly 40% of your supervised heroin group uh, giving the vast majority of their urines. And, you know, because I'll often be a really soft touch, what if you gave two, you said, okay, I'll allow just two lapses if the rest are okay. You know, you've got nearly two, you've got well over half uh, of your supervised heroin group uh, giving mostly clean urines compared with, uh, you know, about a quarter of the other two groups. Okay, this is the next really interesting graph. We then looked at the three groups about what proportions of the urines they were giving uh, throughout the whole treatment, uh, you know, were, uh, were negative. So here's your oral methadone group. So this is negative for street heroin. Here's your oral methadone group. Uh, so you're seeing that, and these are, uh, this is the six months of the trial. So, you know, by about a month or two, you've got 15 to 20 percent uh, who, who've actually not, now given urines uh, that are negative, which we were surprised to get any progress with this group at all. Uh, here's your supervised injectable methadone group, so slightly better, but not greatly better. <laughs> And here's your supervised injectable heroin group. And what really we found clinically very interesting, we were measuring this right-hand bit of the curve as what we'd said we were going to look at. Uh, but actually, by about six weeks, it was clear whether people were benefiting or not. So if you were looking at doing it in everyday clinical practice, not in a trial, personally, I'd be saying, you know, to... Charlie or whoever it is I was, you know, I was working with, look, you know, we, we've got a couple of months in which to show this is really helping you turn things around. Or if it isn't going to work, we just sort of say, well, there's a pity we thought it might work. So that makes it operationally, you, you're not having to wait a year or two to see, is it showing benefit? You're likely to know pretty quickly. Um, <coughs> The issue of cost comes up uh, and everybody goes, ooh, you know, terribly expensive. So sort of costs, so optimising your oral maintenance, I don't know, something like £5,000 per patient per year. Uh, supervised injectable methadone, something like 10000 Supervised injectable heroin, something like £15,000 per patient per year. And people go, ooh, you know, isn't that a lot of money? Well, let's put it in a bit of context. Uh, so if you've got you know, sort of court-mandated treatment and the monitoring, that's about £10,000 per patient per year. Uh, if you look at prison, it's £44,000 per patient per year. And you know, part of our job is to say that our patient population, you know, if we have a treatment that delivers the benefit that we're trying to deliver, uh, it's not actually such a large cost. Uh, because it doesn't matter how cheap the treatment is, if it doesn't deliver any benefit, it isn't cost effective. <laughs> I know you're, doing a co you, you're thinking of doing a cost effectiveness, or it's certainly an analyzing the data on cost effectiveness. Uh, my colleague Sarah Byford, who heads up our cost effectiveness uh, health economics unit, uh, helped us do cost effectiveness analyses. Uh, this will the next slide will be of interest to maybe two people in the audience, but it's, uh, <laughs> uh, 
the, the key thing, what you get here when you do a cost effectiveness analysis, and my apologies, if there's a whole table of people who are familiar with these, then my apologies. This was, new, this was fairly new territory to me. But what you're looking for in a trial uh, is for your, your benefits uh, to be in the bottom right-hand quadrant. So on one way, uh, you're, you're looking at the incremental cost. You know, so how much is the treatment costing to deliver? And over here is how much benefit is delivered. And what you're getting by on the right-hand side is the benefit is consistently delivered. And below the line, it's, it's the cost per unit of benefit is less than the comparator. So that is what you dream of having in a trial, is most of your data clustered in the right hand corner. That's the end of the health economics sort of tutorial, OK? And, um, OK, I'm getting very near. <laughs> so the four research conclusions is the supervised heroin group uh, very clearly gave the strongest data for this treatment non-responsive population. Uh, optimised oral methadone, it's notable we were able to achieve benefits, so we should have been doing more work. These were referrals from experienced colleagues where I'd have thought we were already had optimised treatment. So that ought to make us think, shouldn't we look at ways of making that treatment better? And the other thing is the very rapid onset of that benefit. Uh, important clinical conclusions is it's like having intensive care in the community. This is not an easy thing to deliver, and it wouldn't, you know, it would be conceptually irresponsible to somehow think that the medication did it on its own. Uh, it, it was a very high intensity, high care approach. It had its risks. Um, you, you certainly shouldn't be doing this if you don't have similar facilities to what you'd need to be having with a, with a safe injecting facility. You need to be prepared for high risk uh, situations that might arise, like, like sudden profound overdose or you know, um, cardiac irregularities and so on. Um, and you're not seeing this as a major treatment for all patients, you're looking at this for perhaps your worst 5% patient population, as occurs in lots of other examples in medicine and its um, provision. So the, the last few slides is some, where are we in the UK in terms of policy issues? So the government's 2008 drug strategy said that uh, you're subject to the results of the findings from the trial, you know, which is the paper I've just shown you, uh, you know, pilots exploring this type of treatment of supervised injectable heroin prescribing uh, should be rolled out. Uh, you then had, uh, south of the border, uh, you had the Department of Health uh, commissioning uh, as clinic, so not, nothing to do with the trial, this is after the trial, uh, commissioning supervised injectable opiate uh, treatment clinics. Uh, three clinics were then set up and uh, ourselves in London, Brighton and Darlington uh, were successful in winning the competitive tender uh, to be uh, the three clinics that continued. Those continued until last year uh, when there was no decision to close them. There was just in the, in the competitive environment of funding when cuts came in, uh, much to our irritation, we were part of people's way of making a sort of a, a quick saving. Uh, there's a major review, uh, which is in the report, the excellent report that you've uh, recently published up here. You've sum summarized this very well and brought it up to date. Uh, if anybody's wanting, there, there's a monograph that EMCDDA did. Before you hit the print button, it's a couple of hundred pages and you can just send the MCDDA an email and they'll send you a stock of the actual printed uh, manuscripts which are much nicer. Um, and the very last point is now, you know, this week and for another week or so, there's a public consultation exercise about the Pan-UK Orange Guidelines rewrite which is sort of roughly every eight years or so they get rewritten. 
uh, the expert group's finished its work uh, drafting those, and they're in a public consultation phase. And within, uh, within those orange guidelines is a section about supervised injectable heroin treatment, and it says there is a compelling evidence base in support of making injectable heroin treatment available to those who continue to be at risk despite optimised opiate substitution treatment. A small section of the treatment population need this, uh, and these patients may benefit from special assessment for it to be considered. So it's there. There's a couple of pages on it, but that's the sort of headline section. So you've actually got a context for a proposal uh, to do so uh, in Glasgow. I think it'd be really exciting. Well, thank you very much.